get out of the transmitter and turn the transmitter and come on the air and come on the air about 10 o'clock, the door opens, in comes Hugh Pyle. He's pastor of the Brent Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. He'd uh, said a word to me before, but never, you know, just a few words. And he comes in that morning, he sits down, I'm looking at him through the console there, through the window, and about that time the Lord says, now you said, fellow there? Now he's got what you call guts. You better talk to him when he comes out. I looked the window through him and size him up, and I said, well, that girl scout. I mean, he always did look, you know, 20 years younger than what he was. I figured he'd drink nothing stronger than buttermilk. And I said, he never been anywhere. He don't know nothing. The Lord said, if you don't think that fellow got guts, you just check him when he comes out. I said, okay, I can't will. So he finishes talking on the radio, and he goes by the door. As he goes by the door, I said, hi, preacher, what do you know? He turns around and says, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you know? I like to swallow my cigar. And I said, well, I don't know him. And he said, would you like to know him? And I said, sure. He said, what are you waiting for? Who well, seemed to me kind of a stupid question. <laughs> I've been, been busting my can for three months, you know, trying to find something. He says, what are you waiting for? <laughs> and I says, well, I don't know if beats the, you know, out of me. And he says, well, come here. And he took me back in the record room. He took out a Bible. He said, you believe this is the word of God? You didn't see me throw that one away. <laughs> I said, yep, that's it. He said, you believe you're a sinner? I said, oh, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. He said, you believe Christ died for sinners? I said, yeah, I guess he did. He said, you believe he died for you? I said, I don't know, I guess he did. He said, you believe he could save a sinner? I said, well, I suppose he could. <laughs> he said, you believe he could save you? I said, beats the, you know, out of me. I don't know whether he could or not. And he said, well, all right. He said, if, would you ask him to save you? I said, sure. And he said, take my hand and pray. So I took his hand. He said, now bow your head and pray. I said, I don't know how to pray. And he said, well, just in your own word, just ask Christ to save you. So I took him by the hand, I bowed my head and said, Lord, I'm a blanket of blank sinner. And I'm going to help pretty blanket of blank soon if something don't happen pretty blanket of blank quick. <laughs> and I said, God, I want you to save my blanket of blank soul for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I looked up at him and he was, he was kind of smiling. I said, what is it? He said, nothing. He said, you mean that prayer? I said, you blankety-blank right I meant that prayer. And I did. I did. I did. But you see, you know, you get talking that way. You don't know what you're saying. Those guys out in the world, they just get talking that way. They don't even check it. And he said, well, if you meant that, you're saved. And I said, I don't feel any different. And he said, you're not supposed to feel any different. And I said, well, I don't know I'm saved then. He said, you just know. I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. I said, I do not. <laughs> He said, you do so. I said, I don't either. And it was getting bad, you know, for a minute. And then he reached, and then he took up that Bible again, and he said, read that. And I read, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. God says, there you know. Do you know it, don't you? And I read that thing, and I said, well, I guess. He said, what do you mean, guess? What does it say? Well, it says, these things have written unto you that be in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. He said, do you know you have eternal life? He had me between a rock and a hard place, man. And I said, and I said, well, uh, uh, well, and he said, you don't think God's a liar, do you? I said, no, 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 I'm a liar. He said, well, God said there, you know. Now, do you know or don't you? And I said, uh, okay, I know. <laughs> and uh, I didn't feel like I did, but I had to say something. So I said, I know. I didn't know. And he said, uh, would you be ashamed to confess Christ your Savior publicly? I said, no. He said, all right, you come out to our church next Saturday night, Youth for Christ, and make a public confession. I said, I'll be there. He said, what church do you go to? I said, St. Michael's. And he, he had a lot of wisdom, you know. He, he had a lot of wisdom. Instead of doing something about that, he said, and you wouldn't be ashamed to come out? I said, no. He said, okay, we'll see you. And walked out the door. Well, the week went on. Up there in Hale County, Mom May sent me another Bible, Schofield Bible. The front of it had uh, Proverbs 3, 15 and 16. Uh, Trust in the law with all your heart, lean not to your understanding. All thy ways acknowledge him, he shall direct thy paths. And all that week I read that Bible. And some of it began to open. I was still in the dark, but I began to get a little here and there, you know. Got on that bus and came out to Brent, to make a long story short. I heard the first gospel sermon I ever heard in my life. And I heard the first gospel invitation I ever heard in my life. And they didn't get through two standards. They sang, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou, and I was there. I was there, boy. I mean, yellow, white suit, yellow tie, black shirt, and the whole works. 
And I came down and knelt. When I knelt there and asked the Lord to save me and confess Christ, I got assurances like that. I've never lacked assurance since. That's the first red flag. You see, I was a Baptist for 15 years, and I am very familiar, although I have observed many different kinds of Baptists. They have a very similar mainstream, easy believism, faith alone, can't lose your salvation, sinner's prayer, endorsing watered-down gospel message. Now, the Lord said to him that he's got guts and he better talk to him when he comes out. Well, if he does not preach proper doctrine and he teaches faith alone, easy believism, eternal security, watered-down gospel message, yes, he has guts all right, guts to teach false doctrine. So by his statement of, I know the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you know? Would you like to know him? Well, come here. If he knows the Lord Jesus Christ, then he better be teaching correct doctrine, otherwise he's completely oblivious, like most Baptists are. Now, as you already heard it, here is the pathetic gospel message and dealing with a sinner. Here's how this Baptist pastor dealt with Ruckman. This is the summary quotations as you see here. He didn't even show him what makes him a sinner. The heathen in the world, they may believe they are a sinner, but they don't know why. And even if they do know why, it's still the responsibility of the saint to show them from God's word why they are a sinner, at least from logic and consistency. Then, quickly jumping to Jesus dying for sinners, and Ruckman says he guessed he did, and he said he didn't know if Jesus died for him, and he just opposes that Jesus could save him and a sinner, he said he didn't know if he could or not. So based on guesses and suppositions, he quickly shifts to asking Ruckman if he will ask Christ to save him. He doesn't know why he's a sinner, most likely, doesn't know by confidence from God's word as evidence that Jesus died for sinners, can save sinners, and could even save him. Then why would you quickly talk him into saying a sinner's prayer when he doesn't have any assurance or confidence in what he guesses and supposes? That's quite careless. That's a clear example of a watered-down, crafty way of talking someone into asking Christ to save them. Sounds very similar to the tactics like Jack Hiles and his cult followers did. And then this so-called blankety-blank <laughs> sinner's prayer that he says. I understand people not knowing how to talk or pray when they're asking Christ to save them at the beginning does not acknowledge why he's a sinner, though. What he deserves as a sinner, what he believes about Jesus being the creator, not even his death, burial, and resurrection. And he's asking Christ to save him based on this supposition that he's going to hell if something doesn't happen quickly soon. That's not even a sincere sinner crying out for God to save them because they don't have the proper understanding of why. Now here's the next section of the conversation. Why would you ask him if he meant that prayer when he doesn't even have the proper understanding of why he was asking Christ to save him? This pastor was some airhead. Then Ruckman contradicts himself by telling him he meant the prayer, but then explains that you get talking that way and you don't know what you're saying, so he lied to him. Just like if a mother tells her child clear instructions of the chores they are to complete, and then asks, do they understand? And the child says, you're darn right, I understand. But then in their mind, they know they did not know what they were saying. Then they are lying. Now, according to this part of the conversation, just telling him you just know is not assurance by logic, consistency, and evidence from God's word. And then he says, read that. And then he explains it, and they go back and forth in this summary of the conversation. Do you know you have eternal life? 
That's a question implying that he believes you have eternal life the moment you first believe on Christ by saying a sinner's prayer. That's a lie, and not taught in scripture. Then he lies again by saying he knew, but he really did not know. Now according to 1 John 5.13, the passage that this pastor used out of context, the main classic verse people use to claim, present tense, have, that we have eternal life right now. But you have to look at the other verses that we went through, or if you saw the previous video in the past about every time in the New Testament where the phrase eternal life occurs. It speaks of future context after death. Just like if I were to say, these things have I written unto you that believe my testimony that you may know that I have a new car. Now, what if I bought the car and finished the paperwork, but it's still at the dealership? Does that mean I don't have the car? No. I still had to obtain it at a future time and date. I don't have to physically and literally have it in my possession to still claim to have a car. Now, if I were to say to someone else, as similar to the format of Romans 6.22, but now having finished the paperwork, I have become an owner of a new car, I have my witness document of car ownership, and later in the end, obtaining the car. Would those two statements contradict each other? No, because they complement each other in understanding the entire context of the message. Moving on to 1 John 5, verse number 20. This verse does not say that we have eternal life right now in this life. It just says that the Son, Jesus Christ, is the true God and eternal life. They are identifying what true eternal life is, and that is the Son, Jesus Christ. Let's cross-reference to Jude 1, 20-21. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. If we have eternal life right now, why do we need to look for the mercy of our Lord unto eternal life? Again, Paul explains that in Romans 8.23, as you see here. If we're waiting for the redemption of our body, then obviously we don't have our new bodies yet. Having our new bodies is linked to eternal life. If we had eternal life right now, we would never die a physical death. Now here's the last part of the blasphemous conversation. That's really interesting and not biblical. The first red flag here is when he sent where he was sent a Schofield Bible from his Mama May, I think he said. Schofield had all these notes and dispensational fairy tale ideas that are not taught in scripture at all. I know because I looked through some of his notes, and I used to believe this hyper dispensational garbage. There's some truth in it, but a whole lot of poison. If he admits he was still in the dark, then that proves he was not saved when he said that phony baloney sinner's prayer. He went to the church building and heard and saw the first gospel sermon and gospel invitation he ever heard in his life. Gospel invitations are not biblical the way the church buildings carry it out. Claiming he went down to the altar, knelt, asked the Lord to save him, confessed Christ, and he got his assurance immediately. That's not biblical salvation. Where in the Bible does it say you have to go to the altar, kneel down, ask Christ to save you while kneeling down at the altar, then confess Christ, then out of the air, God immediately gives you assurance? That's nowhere in the Bible. And he has never lacked assurance since? Well, if he teaches once saved, always saved false doctrine, then obviously he will never have doubts of his salvation, most likely. But then again, if he is depending on a feeling he had or some words he said in some fancy magic sorcery magic spell prayer, what if he doesn't feel like he is? You see, as he said and admitted, if you get talking that way and that magic spell, you would have doubts about what you're saying and you don't know what you're saying because people quickly talk you into it as if they are trying to meet a quota like Jack Hiles and his cult followers did. Brethren, this is a clear example. Peter Ruckman was not a saved man, according to what we heard in this clip, and also the other blasphemous doctrine you've read if you read his books, like I have. This is not biblical salvation. According to this evidence, I conclude Peter Ruckman, also by scripture authority, was not saved, and he's probably in hell today. By the evidence. Don't fall for Ruckmanism. 
Ruckman was a false teacher, sincere in some ways, sure, but a false teacher. Biblical salvation is a faith plus works system. Love the Lord Jesus Christ, fear God to keep his commandments, and read and believe the King James Bible. Thanks.